This is The Mud Peddlers, a podcast where two nerdy ceramic artists share the behind the scenes of their worlds of play. We are your hosts, Lindsay M. Dillon. And I am Dante of Earth Nation. All right, so now we are back for the second part of... (laughs) Dante, what are you doing? I'm trying to move my chair. Uh, It's uh, not weird. It's pretty inefficient. It's It's not inefficient. inefficient. All right. I don't want to make sound. (laughs) Someone farted over here. We are on part two of our pottery myths section. Now, to be honest, past me has probably done a little bit of editing to make uh, make a good cut at a great time. So we may end up with some audio from last week's us to this week's us. Anyway, point being, we're talking about more pottery myths. Dante. So our next myth is that you need a website, newsletter, and lots of social media followers before you sell your work. That is the newest thing. And I think that goes <laughs> back to the previous episode where we were talking about how hustle culture and late-stage capitalism Mm -hmm. has bled into especially the young generation of American society to the point where we essentially now think that you need these things to be successful. Yeah. And the truth is they help a lot. They do. But they are not necessary. I will say, though, if you talk to anybody like two generations back, they're like, no. Well, yeah, no, because I mean, so I mean, shoot, like social like, media is only our generation. Yeah, like, they're like, that's nah, man, crazy. I, I was good. Like, yeah, without if social media didn't exist, uh, you would just find another way. Like, you'd be good, right? But it is a great net to catch people's attention. Yes, I think my biggest thing is that like it is a good tool, but you like all of those are good tools, and I think in a lot of ways necessary tools to some degree or another. Some degree, but you don't have to have those things in place to start selling your work. For instance, if you want to try selling at your first in-person event and let's say, let's say you make, yeah, let's say you make pots for plants, right? And you want to go to your local plant foundry and do a little pop-up. You can do that without having a website or a social media account or, you know, all these other things. And that's a really, in fact, is a really great way to like begin to build that base. And the main reason that I wanted to talk about it is because I think I, the way that I get in my own way the most is by saying, I can't do C until I've done B. And I'm on A right now. And realistically, yes, that's the order of the alphabet. But for the purpose of this metaphor, sometimes I can do both C and B at the same time. Well, there was there was something that came up a couple of years ago that was like, I can't apply for an artist residency until I have made 12 more sculptures, right? Yeah. And I was like, okay, yes, having more sculptures would help in a portfolio to be able to show my work to get into an artist residency, but also I could just start applying and and see if I get in and, you know, and try and try those different things. Now, admittedly, I, for many reasons now, I haven't applied for an artist residency, mostly because I'm in a monogamous partnership with my partner and I don't want to be away from him for that long. It, that took um, a wild turn because I was like, do you have to... You gotta be with somebody in the artist residency. Like, oh my god! Oh no! No yeah. no no! It's you were not like, like I haven't done an artist residency because I'm in a relationship. I'm like, F- they make you. F- them? Yeah. <laughs> no God no. I didn't no. know that. No 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 no. I just I'm no. in the wrong game. No, I just say that first because because for for folks who are poly, you know that di- that distance isn't you know is potentially less of a of an issue for various reasons. Anyway, for physical. For, any, for, yeah. 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 But, but point being, so that, that's the, and that's, that's real, realistically, that's the last of our like kind of social myths that we have. But I wanted to bring that up because I think, I think it can be really easy to procrastinate plan where you're basically like doing all the things to, to start something. And then you never start that thing because you're always preparing for it. A lot of bullets in that gun. You ever going to shoot it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of bullets no, in that gun. but don't, but don't. That's a bad metaphor. It's the bad that, metaphor? Yeah, because of all the gun deaths we have in this country. That's a bad, I mean, it's an, appra- like, it works, but it's sad. Look, it works, all right? Like, it, it works, it's, it works, it's, I mean, but it's yeah, sad. Can't, but it's I mean, sad. yeah. So don't fire, don't fire no guns unless you're on a shooting range. A lot of steps on that hunting. ladder, are you going to climb them? Yeah, there you go. Oh, a lot of people die from ladder deaths every year. Oh, my year. God. Oh, I'm my just God. Saying. That's different, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, so I think... So much of the progress I have made in my career is because there was a very uncomfortable thing that I said yes to that I had to sort of 
yeah. rise to the occasion <laughs> yeah. to do. Had to learn that skill yeah. in like two weeks. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, I mean, a great example of that is like when I accepted the commission to make surfwear for inside coffee roasters. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. Now, admittedly, like there's, there's an element of fake it till you make it for sure, but there's also like a realistic analysis of your own skills that needs to be taken into account. Like if I had just started pottery, I don't think it would have been wise for me to take that commission because I, there were a lot of baseline skills that I needed to be able to execute that commission. But when I took that commission, I had never made serveware before. I had never made a series of pieces that needed to hold a specific amount of liquid. So there was a lot of learning curves that went into that project that there were a couple of times where like I miscalculated something and I realized that I had made a set of 30 cups, all of which had to be remade because they held the wrong fluid ounces. Yep. And I cried in the backyard several times when things went awry, but like that was a really valuable set. And I would say like the podcast was the same thing. Like when we first started the mud peddlers and I, I spent so many hours researching like, all right, what are the companies to host the website? What, what kind of, how do the rates compare? How do I get music? What Mm -hmm. kind of music, what kind, what style of music for the intro and outro is going to fit the brand that we want to cultivate. Wild. There's a lot that goes into it. And admittedly, like, because I know you're about to say, you can just jump in and do things. And yes, you can. And I think that fundamentally comes down to, like, the two ends of the spectrum for yes. people. Like, there are people who plan a lot and never do things on one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum are the people who don't plan, jump into stuff, and then that thing falls apart because they didn't plan well enough. Yes. You and I are different animals, though. Yes. In that, like, you pl- you you essentially over-plan. Yes. And then you realize you didn't need that amount of planning that you needed once you get to the actual project. Would I... Uh, I don't think that's actually the case. No? No. Because, well, okay. Because I'll say, I think the thing is, what I what I do is I... I spend a lot more time planning, yes. but by the time all that planning is done, I feel really confident by the time that I have to do the thing. So it's a confidence thing for you. Yes. It's a confidence thing. And it's a sense, it's kind of like that idea that like, oh yeah, throwing looks easy for us because yeah. we've made, we're good at it. So, well, cause we've made so many pieces. Yes. So that's like, I would say my fault on that spectrum that I'm talking about tends to be over planning in the sense that sometimes I plan so much that I never move, that I don't move forward on the whatever project it is that I want to do. Yeah. But what's good is that when I finally do it, I feel really good about it because I've done all the planning. I would say that like on that spectrum, you're more along the lines of like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. And as things come up, I will address those as they come up. That's usually how I work is that like, if something needs to be done, I will try it and see how good I am at it. And then I'll usually mess it up like two or three times. Mm -hmm. But within those two or three times, every failure is such a learning experience. Yeah. That I feel like you and I meet at the same place because (laughs) I've just learned along the way. Yeah. And you've already, I've learned all the physical stuff and you've learned all the technical stuff. So by the time you're there, you're doing the physical stuff. And by the time I'm here, I'm doing all the technical stuff. Uh, yeah it's like yeah, making yeah. glazes like i i just put glazes together and then like i was really bad at it so, like, <laughs> you know but now that i'm at the level i'm at now i know a lot of the te- not all of it but a lot of the technical things that make a glaze good mm-hmm. as for you you probably researched the crap out of how to make oh. glaze right yeah well i i was actually lucky because i had a, a mentor to help me learn how to make glazes so like the first time i made glaze was when i was volunteering at sac city college right so i had the studio technician mimi to like guide me through that process but what yeah but when i started making my own glazes at home like I spent hours trying to figure out the most efficient amount of clay of of, I, I talked about this a little bit more on the last episode but I spent so much time figuring out the most efficient cost efficient amount of glaze materials to buy mm-hmm. like I made a list of like okay these are all of the materials that I need for for all the all the glazes. Okay, how many different glazes need custer feldspar? Okay, what's the total yeah. amount of custer feldspar I need? Okay, that's that's the amount in grams. Okay, I need to convert that to pounds because that's the amount that I order through the website. They don't do grams, they do pounds. Yeah. So, all right, so I have to convert that and then I go, okay, if I do if I order a 50 pound bag versus 25 pounds, what is the price difference between those two and is that going to be worth it over a 
two year span if I anticipate going through one bucket of glaze a year. I feel like you and I have switched now a bit. Yeah. <laughs> because what happened is I started buying my chemicals and I bought like a pound of each. Yeah. When I first started. And then I put them in little tiny jars. Uh-huh. And then I was like, well, these are jars aren't big enough. Uh-huh. And then I bought bigger jars. And now I'm at like the one to two gallon jars. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's how my chemicals fit. So I buy my chemicals five pounds at a time now. Uh-huh. But now I'm, I work at the mineral company as a teacher. So now I'm like really tuned into what chemicals are going to die first. Mm. So I'm like, oh, better get me some EPK now. <laughs> That's about to run out. You know, oh, better get me some Gersley Borate. Yeah. That's, that's about to go down the drain. Oh my you know? God. So now I'm like, well, let me buy 10, 20 pounds of yeah. this chemical. So I have it when companies and other people don't have it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, side point, interesting mm-hmm. dichotomy with companies and us making glazes is that they make them like gallons and gallons and gallons, 100 gallons at a time, right? We make like... A couple pints at a time, so I don't have to keep using. Mm, I make same. I make a couple gallons at a time. I make a couple gallons, then I regret it <laughs> because I make two pints, and I'm like, that's enough for like a third of a kiln load that I need, right, for my size of my stuff. Mm-hmm. But if I make five gallons of Randy's Red, <gasps> I'm never gonna get rid of Randy's Red. Bro. See, I I actually I'm completely opposite because I have like four or five glazes that I know I use all the time, oh. and I don't I I like having my glazes ready to go. So I realistically, I only make glazes, like make them to restock them Mm -hmm. once a year, if that. Dude, whenever I develop a new glaze, I want to use that new glaze, but Mm -hmm. I can't because I have seven other gallons of glazes. Just, I'll buy them off of you. I'll have have the same. No, I have, I found a good combination of Randy's Red and that's about to go. Oh, that's good. That's good. But like. I still have three gallons of my old Randy's Red. And mm-hmm. realistically, this is a tangent, I'm sorry. <laughs> realistically speaking, I'm better at making glazes now. So now I look at Randy's Red like it's crap. I'm just like, ah, <laughs> That's funny. Brown glaze. <laughs> <laughs> at least for what you were wanting to do. Like, again, in developing that red. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did definitely develop a better red. But that's, that's a side point. Yeah. 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 So I'd say my perspective on, again... The myth that you need X, Y, Z or whatever to, to move forward. What I w- The advice that I would give to my younger self is that you will almost never feel fully prepared to take the steps forward that you need to take to grow your business. So just start taking those steps and recognize that you can, you can do X, Y, and Z all at the same time. As you, yeah. as you grow. Yeah, you, you are going to grow as you go through the process. The mm-hmm. more you do it, the more things you're probably going to learn that make the job easier. Just like video editing. It used to take me like a full day and now it's like mm-hmm. three or four hours. The nice. problem is I need three or four hours of constant attention. Yeah. And that just doesn't exist in my world with a child mm-hmm. <laughs> right now. Mm-hmm. But like, don't, not don't over prepare, but also don't jump headfirst into a pool of God knows what. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I think, I think a really good... I think a good rule of thumb is, and I've, I've been trying to do this a little bit more with myself again with like, cause there's a lot of things that I'm fine. I still find myself doing the thing where I'm like, I'm over planning or overdoing, or I don't make time to plan. And I, anyway, anyone who knows how long I've been talking about slip casting knows this. It is good to carve out like 10 to 15 minutes. Like if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed and stuck or intimidated by something, like just spend 10 minutes researching the thing that you need to research yeah. and and set and set because setting a limit will help you avoid doing the thing that I'm always afraid of doing which is like oh I need to do this thing and all of a sudden six hours have gone by and all the other shit I needed to do that day is now I'm behind on because okay. I didn't do it so yeah. anyway so set time limits and know that you don't need a website newsletter and lots of Instagram followers to begin selling your work you can pop something up on Etsy and then begin seeing how it goes you're gonna start small there's yeah. You're, go- you're going to start small. The mm-hmm. high majority of you are going to start small when you start selling your work. Do not equate yourself to other people who have been doing it for a long time. And be like, I'm not mm-hmm. successful in comparison. Comparison is the death of art. Mm-hmm. Just don't do that. Just start where you start and keep mm-hmm. going where you're going. Not only are you likely to start small, I think it's advisable to start small. Honestly. Because then the things that you learn along the way are going to be more like little bumps as opposed to a Mack truck smacking you in the face all of a sudden on jaw right there yeah <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right so that is our last social myth uh we have a few more technical myths to go through we're talking about butts you want to talk about butts dante oh yeah trimming your bottom yeah <laughs> yeah so uh i was like oh are we not doing the podcast anymore oh, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh it's off okay cool um, <laughs> yeah trimming your bottoms there's there's a little war Mm. between potters going on yes where it's like always trim your bottoms don't trim your bottoms no one 
it's not even a myth. No one cares, dude. <laughs> no one cares if you trim your bottoms or not. And like, I mean, people care. Be, they, they, the people like, who care I don't suck. Yeah, yeah. People shouldn't care. I would. What I what I would say to this myth is that it's less about whether you trim or not, and it's more about how much attention you give to the bottom. I will say that there's definitely a lot of cultures that say the places. I forgot. I forgot which culture it's from. I'm sorry. I'm gonna butcher butcher it. I'm just gonna apply it to Japanese because my master told me, and he's Japanese. Anyway, the places that you cannot see should be given the most care. And mm. most people who are not potters don't look at the bottoms and the bottom sides of the pot. Or sometimes the insides. They look at the body and they're like, that's pretty colored blue. And they buy it. Mm. That being said, the majority of people who trim their bottoms are people who put their signature or their artist mark at the bottom of that trim, such as myself and mm-hmm. Lindsay. But people who don't trim their bottoms are often, there's a higher percentage of you, production potters. Yeah. Because what you do is you throw a pot, you take it off, you push the bottom in with your palm you palm the bottom to make a small concave and you get some type of metal or wooden stamp and you put it on the side of the pot or you put it on the bottom of the pot but like it's really not a culture war in between like you should trim your bottom because it's crafter standard and there's somebody else that's like i don't really care as long as i'm making money Mm. those two schools of people both suck (laughs) okay realistically speaking most production potters want speed and efficiency and Mm. most what i'm going to say more so not on the side of production potters, are, like, for me, I think it makes a pot look more complete if you glaze the bottom of the inside. That's about it. That's why I do it. And also oh, my, like, like in, within the footwell? Yeah, within the footwell. Okay, Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. like it to be glazed because I think it makes a pot look more complete. Mm-hmm. That's personal preference. Yeah. It is a myth that you must trim the bottom of your pot. Mm-hmm. Right? I think, and I think for folks who are, like, production potters, they have found ways to still treat the foot with care Mm. like you're still most likely not going to be leaving like burrs or like indents that aren't intentional the difference is that instead of you know flipping the pot upside down and trimming it they're more likely to for instance like use like a a coiled wire cutter so that when you cut it off the wheel it leaves an interesting pattern on the underside of the cup they make a foot somehow yeah the foot needs to be refined but It doesn't have to be done through trimming. It can also be done through faster techniques that don't involve trimming, but that still complete the pot and give give it a professional finished touch. A much better way to say it. I just find complicated ways to say simple things. It's just, (laughs) it's it's just a better way to say it. I think, I think what I'm trying to harken on is that like, there's some kind of weird, like trim your pot, don't trim your, no one cares. And I'm like, you both suck. Both of you (laughs) suck. Both schools of you suck. At the extremes of both, uh, spectrums you both suck Mm. like realistically speaking if you want to trim your bottoms go ahead and do it i prefer a trimmed bottom but i've also have pots in my collection from well-known potters who don't trim their bottoms Mm -hmm. and they look great and i have them for the reason that they look great and they feel good and it's my one of my favorite artists Mm -hmm. i'm not gonna scoff at their pot because the bottom's not trimmed and the signature isn't where i like it Mm, (laughs) i sometimes wonder like you know again i think it's really easy to get super upset like like I guess I just find it funny that, like, for people who pay a lot of attention and are in a, the ceramics community to the extent that they are aware of these arguments and back and forths, mm-hmm. and then people who are on the outside who are just like, okay, okay, uh, what have are you, talking about? Have you, have you seen, yeah, have you seen that comic? It's super cute. It's like, it's like little cats. Of course, you probably haven't seen it because you hate cats. I hate but cats. But it's this thing where it's like, well, or is it cats or is it something? Anyway, it doesn't matter, but it's like, Coffee people who are like, ah, coffee people. And there's other people who are like, ah, tea we're people. the tea people. Yeah. And then over in the side is like the the person drinking hot chocolate with stars in their eyes who says, sometimes I put sprinkles on my marshmallows. And yeah. I'm like, bless those people. <laughs> we need we need the marshmallow loving, unaware ceramic people because the more you get, I think like it, it's valuable sometimes to talk through these things because it yeah. can help define what your own interests and desires are. But I think there's also definitely an element of like, can we just all have sprinkles? It's definitely like, <laughs> it's definitely an inside joke for potters. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. like unless you've been a potter for a second or somebody <laughs> kind of opened the door for you, like you'd be like, what are they talking about? Yeah, I've never witnessed this. Uh-huh. You know what? Go on Facebook and make a, a should I trim my bottoms post in, <laughs> in like one of the pottery things. You'll figure it out real quick. Yeah, yeah. You'll figure it out. You that know. actually that actually kind of reminds me, hopefully this is an okay moment to do this, but to talk about a uh, a moment that felt a little bit like a 
mansplaining moment potentially. Okay, so so when I first started making goblets, I was having a hard time deciding whether I wanted to throw the whole thing in one piece yeah. or to throw the goblet section in one part and the stem section in another part and Classic. then attach them afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, admittedly, I'm the one who put it out there because honestly, like, I, I mean, again, I had never made goblets before. I was really curious, like, for people who had more experience making goblets, what they thought. And what's interesting is that most of the people who came back and responded were like, you know, there is a lot of back and forth. I do it this way. Here are some of the reasons that some people do it the other way. You know, and so overall, most people approach it in kind of like a balance, like this is what I do, but I know that other people do this and here are some of the pros and cons. It was really neat. Mm -hmm. But then there was like one person who was like, oh, definitely do it this way. And I was like, and then like, I looked at, I looked at their, oh yeah, I looked at their profile and I'm like, Maybe you haven't been doing a lot of ceramics. Oh, for very yeah. Long. So it was, anyway, it was oh, just. Oh, you just got red pill right there. Oh, that's, that's, like, <laughs> that's definitely some Dante shit right there. Yeah. yeah. I, I do that at least once every three months where someone's like insults my work. And yeah. then I'm like, let me see what you make. <laughs> I'm like, all right. So this might come from a place of trying to tear me down because you're also down there. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's just to me, to me, what that showed was just a lack of. Lack of awareness, maybe? A lack of awareness. Yeah, like, again, I don't, like, when I, as I'm relaying these, this story, it's like, I don't want to discourage people to, like, when I ask for advice about something, like, like please, I, I, I genuinely want people's advice when I ask for it, right? Yeah. So I don't, I'm not telling this story to, like, like, on this other person. I'm more so, okay, well, admittedly, I was a little salty about it. And what was their but name? I don't, I don't remember their name. Um, Where I they live at? I would never even say their name. Oh name I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to dox them. Oh my God. You know their anyway. security? Oh, yeah, yeah. Social security? But I guess I more so say that in the sense of, and this is part of the reason why we're doing this whole episode in the first place, is that there's a lot of, like, myth busting because we kind of yeah. grow up in pottery thinking that there are hard yeses and nos to things. Yes. When most of the time, things are more nuanced than that. Very gray area most of the time. Yeah. It kind of it kind of reminds me of the first time, well, like when I was a, still a barista and I went to this big coffee convention in Seattle mm -hmm. and I was there with, uh, you know, my other, other barista teammates and stuff, one of them who was our roaster, Ed. Love Ed. Um, and Ed was like, yeah, you know, like it's kind of like when you first get into coffee, then the coffee shop where you work at, you're like, this is the best and only way to make good coffee. And then you see the wider world of coffee and you go, oh, there's lots of ways to make good coffee. Oh, yeah. And it kind of feels like that same thing. Anyway. Well, it's also it's also certain things in the clay world are very regionalized, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So like there's certain chemicals and certain clay bodies in certain mineral deposits that you can get minerals from in like latin america or like not latin america but in like spain that we don't yeah we either don't have access to or they're harder to get yeah than other ease of use materials so yeah. like a good example of this is that um and i know this for a fact because i talked to amico they might not do it anymore this is old information who knows but amico puts food safe stickers on their bottles of glazes for us because we're in california and our bylaws dictate that we have to have oh, those so yeah. when i went to facebook one time and was like hey Food safety, I started talking about it. They were like, you got to test them before you got to send them to this lab. And I was like, well, why would they put a food safe sticker on it if they haven't already tested it and vetted it themselves? And they were like, there's no stick food safe sticker. And I was like, yeah, there is. It was some dude from New York. Oh. In New York, they don't have to put those stickers on the bottles. Oh. So they don't have those stickers in other places of the world. Do they have ones that are like, do they specifically say not food safe if they aren't food safe? I don't know. Oh but my. I know that it's because I only know this because I took a picture of my bottle yeah. and sent it to the Facebook group. Yeah. And he was like, I have never seen that in my whole life. Oh, wow. And I was like, yeah, I assume the company has done its, re the company with teams of chemists have done their research under, to realize yeah. this is food safe for most clay bodies. And there, he was like, no. The, the person, the per like, not the company was saying, no, we don't do the that. The person was saying, no. Yeah, okay, yeah. But it's I'm only sure because that, he's yeah. never seen a food safe sticker before. Yeah. So from his knowledge, he's like, you got to do it yourself. You got to put money into a company and the company tests it for you. Oh, interesting. So it's, there is definitely, a, remember when you make comments on Facebook, a geographical variable to your experience in the clay world. Yes. Depending on like where you get your clay. People come up to me, not come up to me, people message me on Instagram. They're like, yeah, what about this clay body? And I'm like, I've never heard of that clay oh, body. Oh yeah, yeah, That yeah. sounds like a company just made a random clay body. Uh -huh. And like, I, I need to know the absorption rate and the shrinkage rate and I need to know whether it's stoneware or porcelainous of what cone it's at, and they have a weird temperature on it. Oh, interesting. And they just say a temperature. They don't say a cone sometimes. Oh. But those are just different places in the world. Yeah, yeah, Right? Yeah, yeah. So, like, remember, when you when you go onto the internet, not just Facebook, you want to clarify some things. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
clarify things, and also operate from a place of humility, because sometimes... I don't know about that, but... Sometimes the world is, and things are more nuanced than you may understand. Here's the is... thing. Everything's nuanced, to, re- to be realistic with you. Yeah. They just... There's a scale where they fall on the right or the left of how nuanced they are. Except for, like, certain things, like physics. In this... Dimension. In this system, <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. In the system of soul, Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's go through the next technical one that has to do with... I'm basically just going to be pantomiming the rest of these and make yeah, them take guess. Why are you pantomiming all the... Because uh, I want to. Why are we playing Cause charades on Because it's, the... it's, it's fun. Okay, all right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, do you want to do it again or do you, do you want to run it back? Or no, 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 we're good. We're... You're, you're good yeah, with that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Because you made the sound. I'll do it, yeah. Opening a chest. <laughs> Ooh, uh, opening the car, the hood, the hood of a car. <laughs> Opening the jaws of a dog as he screams. <laughs> oh, God. Jesus. No. Your sounds are weird. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, Opening though. your kiln early causes crazing. Miss. Straight up lie. Realistically, what causes crazing in the high majority of cases, and I'm, and I'm saying high majority because I'm sure there's a couple cases where you cause some crazing, but it's not from this for sure. It is the relationship in between the thermal expansion rate of your clay and your glaze. Everything in, well, really everything in the universe, really, has thermal expansion. And I always explain it to my students, like, breathing. When you Mm -hmm. heat something up, it expands, it contracts based on the temperature they go through. Mm -hmm. Things heat up, things cool down, right? And when they heat up and cool down, they have a certain rate at Mm -hmm. which they heat up and cool down, right? So what's happening is that you're trying to combine your glaze and your clay together into Mm -hmm. one product. And sometimes they don't breathe or heat up and expand and contract at the same rate. And sometimes if the clay does a little too much shrinkage or it's sometimes they just don't fit properly because their expansion is a little bit off. They're not in a good relationship. It creates stress in the glaze and that creates those little cracks. And that's what we call Mm -hmm. crazing. Imagine putting on like this may be a a, a bit of a stretch (laughs) of a (laughs) metaphor, but imagine like putting on a jacket that's like way, way, way too small and then like hunching and bending over and then like a seam rips. Yeah. That seam is the is crazing essentially because there's not a good fit if in this metaphor your body is the clay and the jacket is the glaze. Yes. And then it rips, that's the But opening the kiln too early does not do that. And I'm not hold on guy who wants to say no what about all right. It, I'm not talking about a thousand degrees. I opened my kiln at like five or six hundred. Yeah. And I it, let it vent. Cause then at a thousand degrees the issue is more the thermal shock. The th- issue is thermal shock. Yeah. Yeah, and that that is a whole different issue, technically yeah. speaking. The real problem with crazing, and a lot of people are like, "Oh, it's about the food safety of glaze, right?" That is a problem, right? Because like bac- if 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 glaze if yeah, sorry. Oh, because yeah. bacteria and and germs get into the little cracks, mm-hmm. and those essentially like if unwashed, if left unwashed or not washed properly, can cohabitate bacteria and make like mold and mm-hmm. sickness, and it's, it's just dirty. Basically, little germs hiding in those cracks. The real issue is that the cracks or the crazing go all the way down to the clay body and weaken your pots. So you just have less strong mm. pottery, really. That's really yeah. the issue with crazing. But, like, also, like, I'll eat off a crazed pot. I don't care. Yeah. I don't give a dang or doodles. It's not, like... Yeah, again, I, I feel like the example that you brought up, one of the other... Uh, I can't remember if this was on an episode or not, but you were talking about how it's like, yeah, do you use a wooden spoon when you cook? Spoon, wooden spoons have like a 50% absorption oh, rate. Oh, yeah, that's the absorption so, like, rate. That's the vitrification vit- thing. Yeah, that's more vitri- but good again, like dealing yeah, with, like, it's food a, safety, yeah. with food safety. It's, I always give people this information and then I give them the asterisk. And like, mm-hmm. I'm always like, look, man, no one, out, like doctors are not lining up. Like, we have to stop this craze where people are dying <laughs> yeah, left yeah. and right. There's, oh my, people are getting sick mm-hmm. on the daily. The things that are killing your kin are not pottery, dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It's like the absorption rate thing, right? Like vitrification needs to be less than... 1% absorption rate in order to be vitrified by standards. Mm-hmm. And then anything, I think above 1 or 1.5%, do not quote me, it's called semi-vitreous. Mm-hmm. And people are like, well, it's not vitrified. Oh, it's yeah, only yeah. semi-vitreous. And then I'm like, well, that's scientifically true, but also like... Like what that means practically is... Pra- like our ancestors have been surviving off of low fire and pit fire wear for generations and not dying or getting sick. And mm-hmm. we've been using them as tools and as like plates and jars to hold our grain and water and wine. And, like, you re- you really think the Greeks had, like, underneath 1% vitrification <laughs> <laughs> or, like, uh, absorption for their all their stuff? Like, no, they, like, they probably just put that in fire and called it a day. They don't know what absorption rate it is and things of that nature. Their pottery probably sucked hard, but we have the advent yeah. of technology. Yeah. I mean, if it survived thousands of years, then it must pottery. have been. Yeah. Well, it must not have sucked too bad. 
No, it doesn't suck too bad, but in comparison to like the standards that yeah, we have today, no, for, for sure, like for our sure. stuff is a hundred percent stronger than what they had, unless yeah. they have some magical stuff in their stuff. Yeah. It's really not that bad to have semi-vitreous work as a functional wear. I'm like, yes, it is. I'm like, you have a wooden spoon at home? Mm-hmm. Say, yeah. I'm like, is it one of those like old, my Mexican grandma handed it off to me and I've been cooking with it for four generations? She's like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that thing is super absorbent. Yeah. It's not sealed. Mm-hmm. It's not lacquered or anything. It's not like, you cook with that, don't you? Yeah. Every day. And then you barely wash it, rinse it off, put it back where it goes. <laughs> yeah. I feel, be, I feel called out right now. Yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> you You will be fine. You're not, no one's dying out here from that, right? There's a, there's a studio practice and there's like a technical practice and the technical practice is always very definition and like, like this is what the definition is. And so the studio potters go, Mm -hmm. that must be the overall truth. Yeah. And then usually experience will tell you like, oh, well, technically it's true. Mm -hmm. Asterisk. No one's doubting. No one's dying out here. There's a lot of complexity between like what we experience and how that gives us the impression of like what is real and then like the science then being like, well, what is real? But then being like, all right, how much of the science? Yes, there are like, for instance, scientific differences between semi-vitreous and vitreous. But what does that actually mean in practice? It's a percent and off. yeah, and then and then information changes, and then information yeah. spreads differently. Yes. Like when I was beginning pottery, the whole thing was that, oh yeah, what causes explosions is air bubbles, and now it's like, well, it's mostly moisture now. It's the moisture yep. in those air bubbles, and this is why air bubbles. You know, it's it's about the yeah. So. Yeah. It's just information, as I, as I said before, approach things with a humble yeah. attitude because we are always learning more things. And there's also a very interesting generational dichotomy in between those things mm-hmm. because what happens is that the scientific community studies a thing and then tells an entire generation of people, this is what we know about it. Yeah. And then they cement it in their minds mm-hmm. and then they regurgitate it amongst themselves and that works for them in their generation. But then if that scientific community decides to update their information, then the older generation, and I say older not in, like, age, but I mean, like, the people who learned that last information last. Yes, yes, will, yes. Will generally keep regurgitating information, while the newer, people who are newer to the science are trying to be like... Are like, no, the, the information's updated, and that causes some type of conflict in between, like, this is the way it's always been, and it's always worked, and then the other people, the newer ones, are like, well, it's worked, but it's only worked because you got lucky. Realistically mm-hmm. speaking, this is what's going on, this is the updated information from the same source you got it from. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And that's, yeah. that causes a lot of tension online. And it usually takes like three generations or so, I think I saw last, for information to catch up for people to widely accept it. Mm. But that's only because the word spreads slowly. And usually by the third generation, the generation that regurgitated the information died. Uh, uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. solely the reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, the information spreads so much more quickly these days. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what that you know rate would be now. But, uh, yeah, that's true. I yeah. haven't seen that study for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It would be very interesting to see. This. I'm, I'm a perfect example of it. I'm regurgitating three generations. <laughs> it, it could be two generations. <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Because information spreads so quickly yeah. now, mm-hmm. while we have uh, a literal god computer in our hands. Yeah. yeah. With more power than we went to the moon with. Mm-hmm. And we still have arguments. <laughs> Wild. All right. Shall we cover our our last myth? Yes. Here, here. I'll pantomime it. <laughs> are you sick? <laughs> are you, what are you doing? <laughs> are you a clown? What are you oh, doing? Oh God! <laughs> a monster? <laughs> no, I'm actually. Gone. <laughs> Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay, say it. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk about silicosis. Yeah. Right. So. The myth is that it's really, really easy to get silicosis. The myth is that it's ultra, ultra, ultra dangerous and you need to have perfect ventilation at all times and you would die otherwise. Yes. Instantly, in fact. Mm -hmm. Within two hours. Mm -hmm. If you're breathing dust. Yes. Now, Um, of course, all that's to say, like, yes, if you're creating a bunch of dust and clouds, like, yes. Do your best, do the best you can to have a, a fan going, try and get some ventilation in there. And of course, wear an N95 mask. Circulation good. Circulation good. Circulation good. That being said. Yes. That being said, it's really not as dangerous as you think. So there's two people who are really, well, there's three. Yeah. Well, well, silicosis is dangerous, silicosis. but it's, but it, the risk of it is not as high as people think. Well, yes. Yeah, silicosis is dangerous, but the, you're right. The risk of even getting it is relatively low in our current cleaning standards. As long as you have proper cleaning standards, honestly, and it's you're not making like dust clouds everywhere, 
you're relatively safe. And I say relatively because there's other groups of people, and I'm, I mean job of people, who are more at danger of silicosis or getting silicosis than others. Mm-hmm. For example, construction workers who work indoors, they have like safety regulations that say you must be wearing a mask. Like you have to. Because when, they, when they're sawing off clays and gravel and dust and silica get up into the air and mm-hmm. they really create these giant clouds in their construction area, right? Outdoors, it's way, way less dangerous. Mm-hmm. But as far as I know, silica is heavier than, way heavier than air, mm-hmm. technically. And because of that, most of it floats to the ground. Yeah, where, what, and what was the study that you were exposed to that talked about that, where they wore the necklaces? That was actually on an episode of For Flux Sake, and they oh, left yeah. sources... Um, and I think it's labeled like silicosis something, something, something. Yeah. It's like yeah, a year ago, honestly. Yeah, it was a bit ago. Yeah, because and because again, like Dante and I are, it's ironic actually because we're talking about myth busting, but we don't exactly have like, our source is another source that has the sources. No, I went to the original because he told me where it's from and I went there and I was like, oh, it's true. But yeah. I do not remember it because it was a year ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so if you, if you want to... If you want to hear more details about why this is the case, go to For Flux Sake and look up their episode. But we're basically just summarizing some of that here. I'm, yeah, I'm essentially razoring it down or regurgitating, to be honest with you. But that being said, it's it's there was an experiment where people wore these necklaces that capture silica to see how much silica they actually get through a normal workday. And it was a way, way less amount than you would think. And the primary reason is because silica is way heavier than air and the high majority of it is on the ground. Your shoes are more likely to catch silicosis than you are. Hmm. And the high majority of the stuff that's near your mouth and your face is not the silica unless you have dust clouds everywhere, right? So I do want to keep in rotation the habit, especially culturally, of having good, proper ventilation and wiping things down and keeping a clean space just because we as potters deal with silica a lot. And there's always like, don't sweep in your studio, you'll catch silicosis. Uh. Not really. (laughs) Yeah, to be... I mean, like, you're not sweeping up like clouds and whatnot just mop it if you want to sweep up a little dust go for it man yeah Yeah, to be honest that's that's actually what i do like because again my my studio floor there are areas that are firm enough to to properly mop like that actually has like good concrete but half of my studio is covered in a really shitty non-concrete concrete that creates sand grit basically all the time so i can't really mop it because it just ends up it like drag the mop fibers drag up more sand yeah so it just doesn't it just doesn't work so i what i will normally end up doing is periodically like again i try and do my best to like wipe down surfaces you know if there's an area where i like i'm gonna spill some slip or something yeah i'll wipe it up you know but i tend to when when i do sweep i open up my big doors um if i have my mask i'll put on my mask um, I'll, I'll set up my little window or I'll set up a little like fan to try and get some of the air pushing the dust out. Mm-hmm. I sweep, you know, some, I try not to, you know, flick big clouds into the air, but I do sweep. Yeah. Normal sweep yeah. guys. Yeah. Like don't. Yeah. And then I will also tend to like leave, then like leave the studio for a little while yeah. as to let like the dust settle and to let the fan try and like brush some out. Please don't do Shaolin Kung Fu with your broom in a, in like while the silica's on the ground and then be like, oh, silicosis. <laughs> they said I can sweep. That's crazy. Nah. Like just sweep like a normal person, get a dust pan and make little into, and then throw <laughs> in the trash or wherever you throw it. Yeah. And you're good. But realistically speaking, potters, especially nowadays, because some time ago, potter's lung was a more common occurrence than now because we have better safety standards. Mm. But, like, my great-grandfather definitely worked in a factory full of dust Mm. and did not have a mask and was cramped in a room in an industrial place full of, like, he was, like, bricklaying, you know what I mean? Mm. Something like that where, like, the standard, safety standard was, like, just be more of a man and you'll be fine. (laughs) Just man, let's get more muscles and you'll be good, right? Uh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we don't, it's not we don't have that issue, we're just more careful about it. So silicosis is something to be watched out for, but like the myth that you can never sweep in your studio or else you're going to die, is it's not that serious. <laughs> yeah. It's really not that serious. If I find the source, because um, I'll have to go back and listen to the episode and then find it and who got time. Mm-hmm. But I will send it to Lindsay, and maybe Lindsay could put it in the show notes. But I'm, yeah, I'm telling yeah. you right now, it's easier for you just go look at the episode. Yeah, honestly, I think that's probably what I'll do. I'll just list the episode in yeah. the in the show notes because, again, like we in general, you know, we try and do our best here to not just spout bullshit. Like we're yeah. when we do talk about things that have like a scientific basis, we're we're doing it to the best of our information with the information that we have at the time. Try and provide you know sources when it's necessary. That's also part of why we oftentimes will talk about things from our 
experiences so that we're not saying things like they're true when they're only our observations and opinions. Yeah. If that makes sense. So yeah. So check out for flux sake again. They're the ones who are like literally chemists and they do a really good job covering a lot of those more detailed things that we cover briefly here, but they really get into the science and they really have the chops to back up what they're saying. And the sort I appreciate that Matt usually come, Matt and Rose usually come with sources as well. So yeah. Usually. And I've also bought his classes. Mm-hmm. So he generally gives me like, instead of just saying a thing, he yeah. says a thing and then goes, this is the source of that thing. Like yeah. This, this is where that comes from. You mm-hmm. know, I, for the beginning, and I don't know if this is, but like f- when you start taking his classes online, he gives you all the minerals and then he tells you like where they come from, what mm. they're made up out of. And I was like, oh, okay. So I understand what they actually are. Yeah. It's not just like I picked up EPK somewhere. He's like, this is where EPK comes from. This is what it is. This is its chemical makeup. This is what it does in glaze. So I I appreciate that even on his pat- podcast, he does that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, those are all of the myths that we have on our list. If uh, if you have any myths or questions or things that you're curious about that you would like us to address, send us a message on social media or tag us in the comments. And uh, yeah, we hope you've enjoyed this myth myth busting. Can we say that? Is that a is that a a, a copyrighted word? I'm so sure it's copywritten. Probably. I'm a hundred percent sure. That's We're bussing. We're miss. Myth bussin'. We're getting on the myth bus. Listen. And we're taking a trip to Myth Town. Myth Busters copyrighted? Myth bussin'? Not the. Not copyrighted. Yeah, we're myth bussin'. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Mud Peddlers. We would love to hear from you. So if you want to share your thoughts about the episodes or just see what Dante and I are working on in our studios, come say hi. You can find links to my social media at lindsaymdillon.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, M as in monster, D-I-L-L-O-N.com. And you can visit my pottery shop or see what I'm working on at earthnationceramics.com. And you can find me all over social media at Earth Nation Ceramics. It's spelled exactly how you think it's spelled. And if you want to support the show, hear some bonus episodes, and see some behind the scenes of my work, you can support me and the show at patreon.com slash Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time.